Said she's gonna stop by later. Is that okay? What? Do you hear that? I don't hear anything. Exactly. I'm packing. Nelly, what did you do? How did she know? Gifted by God with the power to read minds. I don't have any homework. No. I mean, I did all my homework. No. Well, I did some of it. No. Fine, I haven't started yet. There's the truth. The wisdom to restore peace. He said, that's it. We're finished. So sick of this texting. What? Let me see that. Uh, wait, this says sick of this testing, not texting. Oh, right! He was taking the ACT. Thanks, Mom. The insight to see the future. I forgot to think of a science project! Yeah, I thought you might. Yes! With a burst of unlimited capacity. <laughs> and her secret weapon, the look. Hey. Oh, come on, Billy! The 
these abilities combine to form the ultimate example of warmth, tenderness, and dignity. Happy Mother's Day. So that's kind of cool. I got my mom actually for Mother's Day this year. I got my mom a, a set of skull candy headphones. So rock on, mom. I actually have a picture, but she would kill me because she wasn't dressed for the picture. But anyway, hey, uh, happy Mom's Day. And uh, got a lot of folks I know uh, that are visiting with us today. Uh, to see your mom, and we're glad you're here. A lot of our folks have gone to see their moms, so that evened out. And if you are a guest this morning, and you're uh, just in, in, in here because you're looking for a church home, we're thrilled that you're here, glad that you're here. If we could talk to you about uh, your journey and share a little bit about ours, that would be awesome. There's a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out, and then uh, you can uh, put that in the collection plate when it comes by. A little bit later on. We're just really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us today. Uh, I, I think we started this last year, maybe the year before, I don't remember exactly, but we've done it different ways through the years. Sometimes we'll give moms a flower, sometimes it'll be a, a gift of some kind. Um, a year or two ago, we decided let's, let's do something a little, a little different. Instead of just giving our moms something, we decided that we would make a contribution in your honor. And this year we've made one to Child Haven, uh, which is a children's home uh, here in North Alabama that takes in children who need a home. And we felt like blessing them with a gift in your honor would be a way to honor you. So that's our hope. We hope it's received that way. And uh, we, think that, we think it'll be a great blessing to those folks over there. In fact, we know it will. Can I just have all the moms, uh, grandmoms, um, adoptive moms, foster moms stand up and let us just uh, honor you and recognize you? for just a moment. Thank you so much. We love you. God bless you. In fact, you, if you guys just stay up for just a second, moms, we'll just stay up for, stay up for just a second. Let's just, uh, let's just have a prayer over our moms right now. Let's just bless them and ask God to care for them. Father, we love these sisters, these mothers, these daughters, these daughters of yours for all that they do and, and give. We do not expect them to be perfect. Uh, get, they get a lot of pressure in that regard, but all of them, as all of us do, live by your grace, not by our performance. And so we ask you to deliver them from the idea of perfection and deliver them into the knowledge that they are yours by your grace and loved by God, loved by their Father in heaven. And Father, we're thankful for the example that they give us because they show us a side of you. Uh, throughout Scripture, you compare yourself to a mother. And so we're thankful for the way uh, the women in our lives reveal you to us by the ways they interact. Just bless these sisters, these moms, these daughters, these wives. Bless them with your presence, with your love, with your peace. In Jesus' name, we gratefully thank you for them. Amen. Let's all stand this morning now. Let's all stand and join our mothers, and we're going to worship this morning. We'll be focusing a little bit on creation. You'll see that in the themes that come up, and we'll, sit, we'll show you how all that connects together. Just so glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. Let's praise the Lord together. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, 
but the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. From the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. From the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. made by human hands and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything rather he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times and history and the boundaries of their lands god did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far away from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. He himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Think about that as we share this song, as we take our offering. 
You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, and great are you, Lord, it's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you restore. You restore every heart that is broken, and great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we. your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only, and all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing, great. You're my God. 
to uh, read a scripture in Hebrews 2, so if y'all read along with me, and uh, I'll say the prayer for our Lord's Supper. We're starting with uh, verse 6, but there is a place where someone has testified, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put together and put everything under their feet and putting everything under them, God left nothing that is uh, subject to them. Yet a pre but at present we do not see everything subject to them, but we do see Jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while. Now crowned with glory and honor because he has suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might test, taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, he has, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of his salvation perfect though what he has, through what he has suffered both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I declare you your, your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing to your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children of God has given me. Since the children have, of, have flesh and blood, he too shares in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those all free, <clears throat> excuse me, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he has been made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we are so thankful at this particular time for your Son Jesus and for his willingness to come to this earth and take on the same body that we have and experience our troubles and temptations, our heartbreaks and our joys. We're thankful for that gift. And as we partake of this bread, which is the bread of life, we pray that we take it mindful of his sacrifice. In Christ's name we pray.
O cleanser of the mess I made, upon the hill our places trained, stretched on a cross your body crushed, by human hands you formed from dust. How sinful. We try to hide our sins from one another, but they're there. They're before us always. But your son's blood, we call upon it to cleanse our sins. And as we do, we stand perfect in front of you. And this we are thankful. And we're thankful for this wine that represents that blood. And we take it with humility. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. O oh, cleanser of the mess I made, your boundless love for me portrayed, with patience for my learning curve, by holding back what I deserve. How
worship you for all you've done. The God of the seated. Man, that song right there, if you just think about that song, that is so convicting. We will have no other gods before you. Whew. That's almost as convicting as that other song we sang a little bit ago that said, we don't really want riches. We just want you. I wish that were true. That's sometimes I, because you know the truth is, sometimes I want the riches and God, and you know, I want them both. But that's, just listen to the stuff we sing because it's powerful, powerful. So um, why don't you go ahead and look in Genesis, first book of the Bible. This morning's message is not going to be your typical Mother's Day message. Usually we celebrate all the good things about moms or we try to, try to encourage you in some way let you know that you're appreciated and loved and valued, and you are all of those things. Um, tonight, we're going to, at the spring, at 5 o'clock, that's our in instrumental service. Uh, we're going to be in here. Lincoln, are we in this part? Lincoln's not listening to the sermon right now. If you'll just do. <laughs> he's, just, he's surprised I got the time right. So at 445 tonight, we're going to be... <laughs> In here, and we'll be, I'll, I'll be sharing some uh, thoughts about Mother's Day uh, and, and how Scripture kind of plays with the image of God and moms. And so we'll be doing that tonight at 5 o'clock. So that's, if you're looking for a more traditional Mother's Day thing, that's, that's it. Instead of focusing on motherhood specifically this morning, we're beginning a new series on family. 
And it's called Good and Messy, which probably sounds a little bit like your family. And I love these images that Amy uh, helped us come up with, uh, and we'll be changing some of these out through the series. Our, our goal in this series on the family is to try and strike a balance between the truth of what the Bible teaches about family and the grace that is ours for the messes we make when we don't live those truths in our homes and, and in our family relationships. So you are likely to hear some things in this series that, that challenge you and confront you and stretch you and maybe even make you uncomfortable. And, and I actually know that's going to happen because you and I are not that dissimilar and I've been challenged and stretched and made to feel uncomfortable. So that's going to happen to you as well. For example, next week, we're going to spend some time looking at what God teaches, what, what Scripture teaches on the permanence of marriage. And that's going to be a stretch for some of us. That's going to be some, that's going to be some difficult stuff. On the other hand, there is all of this grace that the Bible talks about, which is such a blessing. Because the truth is, some of us have made a mess of our families, and there is grace for that. And the, re the reason I know that's true is because I have been a part of a messy family, and a few years ago, I made a mess of mine, and I received grace, and I so want you to have that. I want you to experience what it's like to be a sinful human being who receives the grace of God and is blessed by it. So that's kind of where we're headed in this series. I mentioned uh, next week we're going to talk a little bit about the permanence of marriage. Did you know that yesterday Tommy and Linda Horton celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary? Can I get you guys just a wave over here, Tommy and Linda? You guys just kind of wave? 50 years. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you're, you're going to hear some challenge, and you're going to hear some hope, some hope for your family, no matter how messy it is. There's grace for all of us, no matter how much of the mess we're responsible for. So let's start with a prayer, and then we'll, we'll jump into Genesis here. Eternal God, our Creator, you have set us to live in families. We commend to your care all of the homes where your people live. We pray that you would keep us from bitterness, from the thirst for personal victory, from pride in ourselves. We pray that you would fill us with faith and virtue, knowledge and self-control, patience and godliness. We ask that you would knit together in enduring affection those who have become one in marriage that you would preserve in holiness those who remain single. Strengthen in body, mind, and spirit those who are approaching the autumn of life and grant a double portion of blessing to single parents. We ask that you let children and parents have full respect for one another and light the fire of kindness among us all that we may reflect your image to one another in our church, to one another, in our families, and to all in the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, Genesis chapter 1, first book of the Bible. Actually, it's the second book. The first book is Preface. Preface. Genesis chapter 1. This is not first a story about family. Genesis is not. Um, it's a story about God. But you can't really talk about Genesis without talking about family. In fact, in a way, the first book of the Bible is organized around the stories of three families. There's Adam and Eve and their sons, and then there's Noah, his wife, their three sons and daughters-in-law, and then Abraham and Sarah and their extended family. They were very late bloomers, Abraham and Sarah, but extremely prolific, sands of the sea, stars of the sky. Prolific. So if you want to talk about family from a Judeo-Christian point of view, and that's where we're coming from, from, from a, a point of view that values the Jewish Christian scriptures, then you pretty much have to start with Genesis, and Genesis starts 
this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering above the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. Now, the, those first four verses, or three and a half verses, set up an interesting pattern. It goes like this. Here's the pattern. God speaks, something is created, and then the created thing is evaluated as good. That, and that pattern repeats six times. So in verses three and four, God speaks, light is created, it is good. Verses nine and 10, God speaks, land is created, good. God speaks in verses 11 and 12, vegetation and the process of reproduction is created, good. Verses 17 and 18, God speaks, the sun, moon, stars are created, it is good. God speaks, fish and fowl are created, verses 20 and 21, it is good. God speaks, the land animals are created, it is good. But when you get to verse 26, the pattern changes in some subtle but significant ways. God speaks, but this time, he's not speaking into uncreated chaos or unorganized existence. He is talking to others. He says, let us make humans in our image and in our likeness. Kind of makes you wonder who us is. Whoever these others are, we can, we can conclude some things about them just by looking in the text. First, it's pretty obvious they're participants with God in creation, apparently possessed of as much power as he. God says, let us make. They are involved in the process of making things. We can also know that they are distinct from God. They're involved in the process. They're co-creators with God. And whoever these others are, they're distinct from God because he's not talking to himself. Otherwise, he would have sounded more like he does in James Weldon Johnson's epic poem, The Creation. If you've never read that, The Creation, Google it. Not now. You're listening to a sermon. Do it this afternoon, after lunch, and just listen or watch somebody perform James Weldon Johnson's The Creation. Epic, gorgeous poet. Here's how it, it, it unfolds. Because God is lonely, God makes the world. This is in Johnson's poem. And when he finishes, he likes what he sees. It's good, but he's still lonely. And then as Johnson imagines it, God sat down on the side of a hill where he could think. By a deep, wide river, he sat down with his head in his hands. He thought, and he thought, till he thought, I'll make me a man. We'll give Mr. Johnson some room for poetic license. Beautiful, powerful piece of literature, but that's not how it happened. A, God was not lonely. B, God did not say, I'll make me a man. He said to these distinct others, let us make mankind, make humans in our image and in our likeness. So God's not lonely. See, th these others are co-creators. They're distinct from God. And here's the third thing we can know about them. They were essentially like God in some deep, intrinsic way. The image and likeness in which humans were created was singular. Let us make humans in our image, not in our images or in our likenesses. So God and these others, whomever they are, are unique yet unified. They are different from one another, yet dyna dynamically the same. Well, who were they? We've already met one of them in verse 1. The Spirit of God was hovering above the waters. That's the Holy Spirit. The identity of the other is not revealed until you get to the New Testament in John chapter 1. Listen to how John describes it. In the beginning, which sounds like what? Genesis chapter 1. It sounds like what we just read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, through him, all things were made, co-creator, without him, nothing was made that has been made. 
in him was life, and that life was the light of men. In other words, the, the other other is none other than Jesus, as we know him, the Son of God. Now, you're probably wondering right about now, what does all this have to do with family? Patience, all shall be revealed soon enough for you to take your mother to lunch before yon Baptists dismiss. <laughs> I know for a fact that they're going to go over today. That's because they're Baptists. That's what they do, all right? Okay, so after this, uh, all in good fun, after this break in the pattern, okay, verse, verse 27 brings us back. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So God has spoken. People have been created. All that's left is the evaluation, the, the, the pronouncement that it is good, but again, there's a subtle shift. Verse 31, it's not just good. It's very good. So what is it that's good? Well, all of it. It's all good. The light, the dark, the land, the sea, the sky, the things that fly through the air or float in the water or creep along the ground, the sun, moon, the stars, the earth itself, it's all good. But the greatest good thing that God created is the one thing that is endowed with his likeness made in his image. The very good thing is humans, male and female. You and me. And for whatever else it means to be created in the likeness and in the image of God, it certainly means that we are created to be in relationship. Let us make humans in our image and in our likeness. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, simultaneously separate yet connected, which sounds to me a lot like Family. Did you know that family is the oldest relational arrangement older than creation itself? Because that's how God is arranged. We're going to come back to Genesis time and time again in this series because we need to remember that family is not just one of the good things God created. It is the arrangement in which God himself Lives. I want you to hold on to that vision, hold on to that idea that family is good, that family is very good, that family is a part of God's good creation, but not just a part of God's good creation. It is a reflection of God himself. And that's going to be really easy for some of us because we came from really great families and we're living in a really great family. Our experience of family has been long on blessing and short on bitter. But for some of us, seeing the good in family, seeing God in family is going to be a real challenge. Because we, we either come from or we're still living in what could be described only as a mess. So let's lean into some of that hope I mentioned a little bit earlier. When we get to the end of Genesis chapter 2, it's all good. But in no time at all, things get messy. A lie is told, and it's believed, and it is acted upon. And then excuses are made and fingers are pointed, but consequences cannot ever be escaped. And Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden. Family goes on, children are born, and though they do not inherit their parents' guilt, the propensity to messmaking is passed along, isn't it always? Sooner than you imagine, sibling rivalry turns violent, and in one of the best turned but tragic phrases in all of Scripture, God charges Cain with his brother Abel's murder. Listen, God says, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. By the time you get to Genesis chapter 6, virtually every family on earth is a mess because Every inclination of the human heart was only evil all the time. God, though, is not, not ready to give up on people. He's not ready to give up on family, but he is ready to start over. And that's when we meet the second family in Genesis. Noah was a righteous man, Genesis 6, 9 says. Blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah, his wife, 
his sons and daughters-in-law trust God, they build the boat, they survive the judgment, and the first thing Noah does when he and his family emerge from the ark is to build an altar. Things are looking good again. We, we've come out of the mess. The mess has been cleaned up. Noah has built an altar. It looks like everybody's going to center everything around God. The second thing Noah does is plant a vineyard. And the third thing he does is drink some homemade wine. And then he gets drunk. And things spiral down into yet another mess. But there's something remarkable recorded in Genesis chapters 10 and 11. You can actually look at it right now in your Bible if you want to. You can thumb over there on your device. Genesis chapters 10 and 11. It's a genealogy. It is one of the most boring literary constructions in Scripture. Okay, I'm going to go on record as a minister of the gospel and say that there are parts of the Bible that are insanely boring. And this is one of them. Because all it is is just this guy was the father of this guy, this guy was the father of this guy, this guy was the father of this guy, and this guy goes on and on and on. What, what, what this really is, though, is a historical account of families being formed over and over and over and over. And the subtle message that we get from that is that no matter how much we foul it up, we still gravitate toward family. Men and women take a vow. Love is made. Babies are born. They're raised. Parents become grandparents. Promises are made. Some are kept, not always. Hopes are entertained, realized sometimes, but not always. Hearts are sometimes broken. Families sometimes fail. But we never give up on the idea. Do you know why? Because family is good. Family is how God lives, and you and I are made to live like God. That doesn't always mean marriage, because some pretty significant people in the history of the Christian faith were single, Jesus, Paul, but we are made to live with each other. We don't have time this morning to get into much detail about the third major family mentioned in the first book of the Bible, Abraham and Sarah and their extended lot. So let me just summarize it for you. Think of the most dysfunctional, maladjusted, messed up, unstable, unlikable, unpleasant, wretched, rotten, reprehensible family behaviors you can imagine. And at some point, they're going to show up in the extended family of Abraham. Their, their family history reads like a National Transportation and Safety Board crash report. And yet, this extraordinarily messy family is singled out by God for a special purpose. You can follow this family all through Scripture, all the way through the Bible. A lot of people don't know this, but there's this, this thread that runs through the Bible. There's this main story that goes all through the Bible, and it, and it, and it revolves around this particular family. You follow that thread all the way through the Bible until you get to a young woman named Mary who is pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, which is remarkable. Even after centuries of fiasco, they're still drawn to form a family. But before they come together as husband and wife, before they have sex, Mary is found to be with child. She's pregnant. And her relatives and her neighbors, and for a moment, even her fiancé thinks, well, this is just another mess. But it's not. Because Mary is still a virgin, and the child growing within her is a miracle. But he's more than a miracle. He's going to live his life as a model of what it means to be an obedient child and a loyal sibling and a loving parent, and even a devoted spouse, but he is even more than a model. He is the Messiah. He is the one we have been waiting for. And he will go to a cross, innocent of every charge, perfect in every way. He will atone for all the sin that not only shattered families, but separated people from God. You heard this passage a few minutes ago when Larry read it. Hebrews chapter 2, 10 and 11. 
Pay really close attention to the words the Bible uses to describe the relationship we have with God. It's the language of family. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of salvation perfect through what he suffered, both the one who makes people holy, Jesus, and those who are made holy, you and me, if we are putting our faith in him, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. If you are without a family, did you know that God wants to welcome you into his? He does. In fact, it's, it's really interesting. When, when the Bible talks about becoming a part of the family of God, you know what kind of language it uses? Family language. It talks about being reborn through the waters of baptism. That's kind of cool, isn't it? You are reborn <coughs> into the family of God. If that's not been a part of your experience, we'll be happy to let the Baptist speed us to the restaurant in order to wait and watch that happen for you. If your family is broken, God longs to heal it. If you have failed your family, God can forgive, redeem, and restore. And if your family is just a mess, God knows how to work with even that. He's got a lot of experience. Let's stand. Let's sing together. He is able more than able to accomplish what concerns me today. He is able, more than able, to handle anything that comes my way. He is able, more than able, to do much more than I could ever. Mother's Day. Just two things as we close. First, don't forget again the spring tonight at 5 o'clock. And secondly, May the 31st, a Wednesday night, is our fundraising dinner for our Ecuador mission te team and their trip to Ecuador. And so we hope that you can make plans to help us support that team as they go to help support that mission. Have a great week this week and we'll close in prayer. Let's pray together. Dear God, our loving Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this, another beautiful day, for the privilege of calling you our Father, for the opportunity we've had to assemble as your children to worship you. And dear God, as we've heard this morning, we know you created us good, but we've messed that up, and we pray for your forgiveness. But in your ultimate wisdom, we know that you also made a plan to redeem us. And we're so thankful for the love and mercy and grace 
shown by your precious son, that he was willing to come to this earth and to die for our sins so that we can be redeemed and live eternally with you. Dear God, help us remember this each day of our lives and strive to live to show our appreciation for that great sacrifice. Dear God, we're also mindful and thank you for all of our mothers, for their love and for their guidance and for everything they do for us throughout life. And help us as not only their children, but your children, to live to show our appreciation for their sacrifices also. Dear God, help us live for you in each day as we live and forgive us when we fail you. We ask it all in your blessed son's name. Amen.